I know what you're thinking. All these things going on in the world right now, World War III, mass acts of violence, certainly all these things can't just be happening right now, coincidentally. And you're right. But honestly, it's really just more of the same. You know, people pick up on it at different times, but really it's been going on for a while now. Maybe it's accelerated recently, but I mean, think about it. Why do you think they've corrupted and destroyed the influence of the church so that our women attend these Halloween parties dressed like prostitutes so that young men of upstanding character will have no interest in attending them? Or otherwise, nobody goes at all because they're just going to get shot up because they've strategically installed these district attorneys who will simply release criminals from prison or just refuse to prosecute them in the first place. Why do you think they've propagandized our society into embracing political correctness and cancel culture so that you can't dress up as anything funny anymore? I need you to remember, these people are trying to start World War III to distract you from carving pumpkins because then all the evil spirits would be scared away and the bad guys would lose. Few understand this, but we understand this. The war on Halloween is real, folks, and it's right here. It's right in front of us, but it's okay. I will not let you down. The spirit of Robert E. Lee appeared to me in a vision after he was released from the statue before ascending into heaven. He told me the absolute best thing I can do right now to fight the bad guys is to autistically overanalyze Halloween movies in accordance with my worldview. And if I do this, I'm granted amnesty for my Yankee heritage. Don't have to tell me twice. Yes, sir, General Lee, I'll take it from here. But it is true, the entire genre of Halloween movies, horror movies, it does tend to be one of the more explicitly right-wing genres of media. And it is important to have a trained eye with popular culture because, as I'm sure you know, something like 80% of everything that comes out of the average person's mouth is in reference to pop culture, the latest thing, etc. Also, the most effective medium of disseminating information that's actually going to be retained by people is and always has been storytelling. And so there is actually some utility in these sorts of discussions. And some of them, yeah, are less serious, but some of them do actually contain some pretty important points about the changing cultural and political landscape of our society, especially throughout the last several decades. So there are some important themes and motifs that we should cover, but honestly, that's all more or less a rationalization. We're doing it because it's fun and I want to. So I will provide to you the correct analyses of these films for your Halloween mirth, merriments, and otherwise general enjoyments, and we will all be better off for it, be except George Soros. He will literally tickle himself in a panic if you watch this video all the way through, because we will go over whether the horror genre is left-wing or right-wing, some brief themes of each, why it's significant, how those themes have changed throughout America's cultural landscape throughout the decades, how it's used to both subvert and affirm our traditional standards, why so many leftists love it and want to claim it, whether it's even possible to make good left-wing horror, and then, of course, our tremendous list, which will continue and expand upon these discussions. So, do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Tommy. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. You know, I can't just start the list, right? I have things to say first. But do you like my Halloween costume? I'm going as guy who has the correct take on literally every movie ever and who likes pumpkins. Okay, here's the thing. I get it. We're all excited here. I have to lay down some ground rules first. First of all, I get messages now all the time from people who are just memeing it too hard. Oh, John, is this inherently right wing? What about this? Is this implicitly right wing inherently? Stop it. You're being disordered. It's too entropic. You're flying too close to the sun like a liberal. I did not come out and declare that Beauty and the Beast was implicitly right wing because it was funny. I did it because it was sexist and vaguely anti-LGBT, depending upon your position on the Beast Furry question. The point is, things actually have to be right wing. Otherwise, you're just being stupid and subjective. That's left wing. Now, that being said, there are some honorable mentions. Sure, this is not a definitive list. This is just five things that immediately came to mind. I'm also not commanding you to go watch these movies necessarily. Some of them are pretty rough, and I, of course, disavow all violence, etc., etc. Look, I'm just a film critic. I'm just a guy who likes ideas. And speaking of ideas, I will be debating key Gamergate figure Brianna Wu on November 6th at the University of South Carolina on the issue of pornography. Some of you may be too young to understand the significance of this, but you should still all definitely come watch. I'll put a link in the description where you can get tickets and more information. Nice. Anyways, speaking of honorable mentions, that reminds me of another thing. The things we discuss have to be central to the plot. Like Friday the 13th, for example, after I tweeted my review of the Super Mario Bros. movie in Scream 6, I had a guy ask if I endorsed Jason Voorhees as an example of vigilante Christian justice. So I thought about it. Is he one of our guys? Okay, well, doesn't talk. That's probably autism. Punishes sinners. He's got mommy issues. It's arch nemesis. Preys upon children. Like, okay, yeah, I'm thinking this is our guy. Or even something like the original Black Christmas from 1974, which John Carpenter took a lot of inspiration from for Halloween, particularly in the cinematography. That movie, 
of course, sparking the popularity of slasher films. You could argue that's all thanks to Black Christmas, maybe Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. But anyways, the guy in Black Christmas, he's basically like an autistic incel, which if, if you haven't seen that movie, you should definitely check it out. It's genuinely unsettling. But like, what kind of message does that send? You know, like, yeah, can the character be literally me? Yeah, it doesn't necessarily make it a right-wing Halloween movie. You know, we have to play by the rules. Also, I have to be responsible with my messaging, okay? It hurts the movement if I come out and say, top five right-wing Halloween movies. And then the reason for each one is that the guy's an autistic incel, okay? That makes us look bad. I can't be doing that. President Trump needs me to not do that. It's reckless. It's irresponsible. We are cool and well-adjusted guys, actually. But yeah, the themes in the story are important. It can't be something too obvious, something explicit, obviously. Like, it can't just be... Oh, you know, The Exorcist, demons are real, hereditary, women are crazy, also demons are real, like it has to be implicit. And it can't be something like they live where the messaging is very obvious and people will say, okay, well, where do you draw the line then? I don't know, guess we'll find out because some people will say the messaging in a movie like Invasion of the Body Snatchers is really obvious with the whole take of, Ma well, it's about McCarthyism and McCarthyism is so crazy and silly. It's like, bro, that's what happened, they were right. And people say that's a good example of left-wing horror, which I think is absurd because that entire genre, like science fiction, movies that deal with things of that nature, those are all very right-wing because the essential conflicts in a lot of these movies are about us versus them, fears of subversion by foreign populations, loss of identity, et cetera, et cetera. And so they'll take that and they'll be like, well, given the cultural context at the time, it's actually left-wing. And it's like, okay, you know, this is a recurring theme with these people because I honestly don't know if it's possible to really make left-wing horror. Like it's been done before, which we'll discuss a pretty good example of in a minute, but it's very difficult. Most people who try to do this just fail because you look at anything that claims to be left-wing horror and it's going to be like some 20th century critique of consumerism. And it's like, yeah, same. Like who says we like consumerism? But in criticizing consumerism, of course, they really mean to criticize capitalism because obviously leftists are not anti-consumerism. Leftists are actually the let people enjoy things crowd. So it's not that. It's just that they're class insecure and they're projecting that outwards onto the world because nobody serious on the right is against criticizing capitalism. But it's very difficult for leftists to properly critique capitalism because their motives for doing so are not disinterested because they're driven by resentment. And so they'll highlight consumerism or they'll highlight material inequality, both of which are to basically say, I'm mad that I don't get to buy things that other people get to buy, which is affirmed clearly by the fact that every time one of these people finds a way to make a living being resentful about inequality, they always keep it for themselves and just go buck wild, which I don't care about. Like, you know, do what you're going to do, but we can't let these people think that they have any moral claim to any issue we face, even capitalism, which we still win the debate on against them or neocons or whomever. And so this is the problem. And this is common with a lot of movies in general nowadays, where they'll use the traditional themes of a right wing horror movie to serve an ultimately progressive agenda by just plugging in a bunch of left wing nonsense into them. Like the actual components of the story, the mechanics of it, how they affect each other. Those don't convey a left wing message. It'll just be like Candyman. Black people have a tough time. Whites are evil. Get out. Whites are evil. Alien. Female protagonist. Therefore, girl power. Like maybe in the 60s or 70s, you'll have something that was vaguely anti-war, maybe. And so they'll claim it, but it's always just the little details. It's like icing on the cake or whatever. And, you know, they're just horror movies that maybe are accented with depictions of colonization, oppression, classism, inequality, etc. But at that point, those are just cosmetic features. Like it would have to be at its core left wing. Or a lot of times a movie will be left wing just because of how vulgar and subversive it is to our cultural standards. And they'll take pride in making something like that. So... Sometimes it's left wing in the sense that the message is progressive, but in a much more real sense, it's left wing because the message is retarded and subversive and defiant to reality. Or a lot of times it'll just be like you took any dozen classic horror movies, you reduce those to an aggregate template, and then you just make that movie a hundred times, but you just cycle between the villains. Like, okay, this one, the white people are scary, then the colonizers, then the men, et cetera, et cetera. It's just lazy. It's just like bloodlust porn for libtards. And we don't get to make movies like that, depicting our enemies with all the caricatures, all these insane scenarios. We just actually have to live with them and observe their behavior. And you know what the biggest irony is? The biggest fans of horror movie consumerism are libtards. Like the Kill Count guy loves gore, but gets mad if a movie objectifies women. Uh, yikes, my guy. Can we maybe not do that? You're dumb. Yeah, me when a cameraman focuses on a woman's body. Uh... I disagree with having to see this. Just say you're gay. Like we could have a whole discussion constructing a model of these types of people because you'd think to yourself, okay, why are all the biggest diehard fans of these McHorror films, which contain terribly violent things in many cases happening to people, uh, why are these people the same people who would pride themselves on being so empathetic and so understanding? 
And the answer is because what these people get off to above all else isn't being empathetic and understanding. It's being empathetic and understanding to people who seek to subvert traditional American society. It's the same thing with the movies, which are in many cases made for the sake of being as brutal and disgusting and gory as possible. You look at the people who really like those movies, they're all leftists. And it's because they get off to the vulgarity and the offensiveness of the material. Sure, there's definitely a component to it that's just about channeling the natural instinct to see violence that we all have. With them in particular, There's probably a dark spiritual component to it as well, but I really believe that they just love subverting what they regard to still be in a position to be subverted. So it might seem like there's a hypocrisy or a double standard to their behavior, but there isn't. Like, it's all directed at the same enemy, which is just us. That's honestly the worst part of it to me, not even like the subversion or the edginess, but that it thinks it is. Like, it's just this cringe faux edginess. Like, you've got these people and they're just beating the corpses of moral authorities that have been dead in our culture for a while. They're trying to act like it's so edgy. Bro, did you just attack Christianity? Are you attacking the nuclear family? You're attacking men? You're attacking white people? Wow, dude, that's so, that's so punk rock. That's so transgressive. What are you gonna do next? This guy can't be stopped. It's like, yeah. This is why it's difficult to make left-wing horror, because so much of what we understand horror to be is about the unnatural threatening the natural order, and so much of leftism is just unnatural. And you can manipulate the audience's perception of the story by highlighting certain characters and events in different ways, but when you really think about these stories and what's going on, it's hard to see how they're accomplishing what they think they are. Like, when you watch one of these movies, we're typically rooting for the maintaining of the normal order against some outside threat, against something unnatural, or sometimes when we are rooting for the bad guy, it'll be when he's, you know, killing degenerate teenagers or when he's punishing bad people in a twisted form of vigilantism, something like in Saw, which is inherently right wing, by the way, that whole idea of the vigilante, because the outsourcing of justice to capable citizens presupposes the collapse or the decline of the liberal order, which can no longer sufficiently protect its people and deliver justice. And honestly, I think that's why in the last decade or so, these superhero stories have become so extravagant with their villains and storylines, because broadly speaking, if it were still just about criminals, people might be compelled to think about you know, the world we live in a little bit harder, uh, what we choose to let people get away with, how it affects our society, who these people are, things like that. So instead, it's about space aliens and time travel and quantum physics and the multiverse, whatever. Not a perfect comparison, but there's still some truth there. But yeah, there's an argument that they'll make, which is that the genre is left-wing because it's inherently subversive and vulgar and it goes against repression in terms of the content. That does happen, but it doesn't have to happen. It's not required to fit the model that we're talking about. But that's why when you look at the types of people who really love the movies that are made purely for the sake of being disgusting and horrifically violent, like for that in itself, it adds up. So I don't know. The bottom line is that for the profile of the average horror fanatic being a leftist to be used as evidence that the genre is in itself inherently left-wing, that would require me to concede that leftists are reliable narrators and not completely misaligned with reality, which I won't do. Also, I did the research. I looked up lists of left-wing horror movies. They're all wrong. Like, they'll take any movie and be like, I'm a surplus repression of patriarchal capitalist societies. And it's like, it's not that deep. I heard some people say Parasite's a good example. I guess it critiques class or whatever. I would have to see it. The problem is, though, for it to really be good, it has to ultimately tie back into something that exists in the real world. If it's just drawing from or inspired by a fake narrative in society that's completely untrue, like most of these left-wing horror movies do, it's not really doing what it's trying to do. It's basically nothing more than propaganda. It's like that tweet, guy who's only seen Boss Baby watching his second movie. I'm getting a lot of boss baby vibes from this. It's like the same thing with these people. They're so consumed and preoccupied with these fake narratives that they see a movie which echoes them and they're like, this is just like real life. This is like really smart actually. This is, this is a lot about society. Moreover, critiquing class in Korea is a lot different than critiquing class in America, but the libtard mind, it cannot conceive of this because they look at South Korea, which is comprised virtually of all ethnic Koreans, and they look at America and they're like, I don't get, like, we have two countries of individuals. Why can't we just compare these? So, yeah, I would have to take some time and and really compile a list, but I don't think it's possible, generally, especially nowadays, to have truly good left-wing horror films. I think that notorious shitlib Stephen King got it right when he said the entire genre is inherently reactionary. Something like Smile is a good recent example of this, actually, which, honestly, I thought was a good movie where it's like, yeah, it's scary or whatever, but the ultimate message is about generational trauma and passing it down and mental health and healing and growing, which is like the whole liberal understanding of human psychology 
analogy. So that was pretty cringe, but I did appreciate at the end where they were basically like, LOL, psych, it never goes away. So who knows? Maybe the director's our guy. But yeah, that's their formula. They want to take the general themes of a right-wing horror movie and then just plug their moralism into it, particularly with the bloodlust stuff against whichever villain is due, which contextually does make it left-wing because then it's meant to inspire resentment towards the remaining living impediments to their agenda. But the class-based stuff doesn't really do that as much. Like that movie is ultimately trying to say, oh, inequality is bad. But then it's like, okay, that's not left wing so much because of that, but more so because it's like delusional and insane. Or they'll also say that horror films became more left wing when the source of the evil shifted from being some outside threat, a creature, a monster, whatever, to being inside of us. Anybody could be brought to this point, And maybe that's supposed to subvert our understanding of morality and conduct. But that's not the part that does that because right-wing people are not optimistic about human nature. So what makes these stories left-wing isn't so much that they shift the evil uh, to us rather than them, it's that they take it farther by trying to basically excuse the evil, attribute it to environmental factors, make us sympathize with it, and basically view morality overall as less objective and more circumstantial. And John Carpenter had an interesting take on this, which I disagree with actually, but we're getting too carried away here. But yeah, it's sort of meta, I guess, like horror movies are right-wing. Horror movies can be left-wing. Horror movies that claim to be left-wing are incoherent, which makes them right-wing because the ultimate takeaway is that liberals are retarded, which is in alignment with the natural order. That's the takeaway with one of these movies. You know, it's like the message is not what is intended, but wow, imagine believing something so f-ing stupid that you actually produce a movie about it. Crazy. These guys are just as bad as I thought. All right, time for your self-improvement advice. <coughs> Got a little bit of a cold, doy boys, but it doesn't matter. Sometimes you can make your day a whole lot better and more enjoyable by changing something small, like wearing comfortable clothing. And for you guys, it starts with your boxers. That's why I started promoting Undertack, the most comfortable pair of men's boxers I've ever worn. Fact, they're not normal boxers that seep chemicals into your skin because they're made with these synthetic fabrics. No, it's made with modal, which is like cotton, except better for reasons that your limited human mind couldn't even comprehend. It's a waste of time to try to explain it. It's 50% more moisture wicking. It's antimicrobial, softer than anything you will ever touch in your life. Comes with a sturdy, comfortable, extra wide waistband. It's fly design, if you know, you know. We're not reinventing the wheel here. It's durable, lightweight, fade resistant, shrink resistant. Here's the best part they're almost 30% less than the competition. So you got to go buy an entire drawer full right now at undertack.com. That's undertack.com. Get 20% off site wide with my offer code DOYLE20. By the way, Undertack donates a portion of its profits to veteran-run organizations that are actively fighting human trafficking, which by extension owns the libs. Take my advice. You have nothing to lose. Undertack comes with a satisfaction guarantee. Have I ever steered you wrong? Have I ever been wrong? Be smart. Pick up a pair of Undertack today at undertack.com. Offer code DOYLE20. Very epic. We continue. This is not going to be a thorough analysis, by the way, of like right-wing themes and horror as a genre, etc. We can do that later if you want. This is going to be fun. If we learn a thing or two along the way, great. Uh, All right. So getting started in no particular order. Got to start with this one, though, because it's a nice transition from what we were just talking about. Number one, Halloween, the original John Carpenter film from 1978. Funny story with this one. I've always loved horror movies. I remember the first time I saw this, I was with my dad. I think I was maybe like seven or eight, honestly. Uh, And he'd been telling me for my entire life, this is the scariest movie ever made. People were walking out of the theaters when this came out. I don't even know if that's true, but we started watching it. I was so freaked out by what I thought was going to happen that I think I only made it to the part where Laurie's like walking home and then Michael Myers just like emerges from this bush and then goes back behind the bush. And I was like, okay, can't do this anymore because I got myself so worked up about what I thought I was going to see. But yeah, the original Halloween from 1978, if you haven't seen it, I'm going to spoil it. You've had plenty of time. Essentially, it begins with a six-year-old Michael Myers killing his sister on Halloween night, 1963, with a knife that he retrieves from the kitchen after he's left at home with her and she's messing around with her boyfriend. His parents come home. He's standing outside dressed in a clown costume with this look on his face, still holding the knife with his sister's blood on it. And his parents take off the mask and just imagine what they're going to see when they go inside. Uh, Really quickly, people will say that the whole slasher genre is right wing because the victims are typically teenagers who are partying, sinning, dabbling with the occult or whatever. There's something to be said about that, certainly. Just like there's a lot of stuff out there already analyzing different sci-fi films through this lens, particularly with the us versus them motif. But I want to focus on some other components, which I think are worth discussing here. So this opening scene, very iconic, and it depicts well what a lot of people will say is the left wing transition uh, within horror films starting maybe in the 60s, but 
definitely in the 70s, which is that the evil comes from within. It can be anybody, etc. And John Carpenter, actually, who directed this film and wrote this film, uh, was also called The Master of Horror. He said something interesting about this, which we just alluded to. So I'll play that right now. So take a listen. It's one of the two scary stories that we, we can tell. One is the evil is inside or the evil is outside. Right-wing evil is always outside. It's them Different color skin, different the way they talk is different. Now that goes way back to us tribal. We're sitting around the campfire and we've just come out of the trees. And the, uh, the witch doctor says, I'll tell you where evil is. It's out there in the woods, in the darkness. It's the next tribe. And they're going to come in here and things will be impure. And they'll take you over. That's right-wing evil. Left-wing evil, same situation. We're sitting around the campfire. Witch doctor gets up and says, I'll tell you where evil is. It's right in here, and he points to his heart. It's in each of us. We have the capability to commit evil. The good man chooses not to and fights against those impulses. The reason his model doesn't work is because the right-wing view of human nature can actually fit both of these models, which he assigns individually to the right and to the left. Like what he says about left-wing horror, that we're all vulnerable, and it's only through strength and discipline that we can choose to be good, that's not left-wing, because that is a skeptical view of human nature. That's right-wing. The left-wing view of human nature is that people are basically good, uh, and when they do things that aren't good, it's because of socioeconomic factors, neurochemical imbalances, which they can't control, etc. Because since we're all the same, if people behave differently, well, it can only be because they were introduced to circumstances which compelled them to do that. We're all the same function. We just get different inputs and that's unfair. So we have to address that at a societal and institutional level. It can acknowledge wrongdoing only within the context of ultimately placing blame for that wrongdoing on something that is external, something that's totally separate. And conversely, left-wing horror, like we mentioned, can still use those themes of us versus them, subversion, etc. but they will do so in service of ultimately vilifying men, white people, Western civilization, etc. So it's not so black and white, I don't think. And the reason we know this is true, by the way, is because in his own movie, Halloween, when we get that shot of young Michael Myers, that's what he's alluding to right there, like that the evil can be within anyone. It doesn't have to just be within some out group. It could be within a peaceful Midwestern suburb. Okay, well, what is the rest of the movie saying, though? Who are our protagonists? So the rest of the movie follows Dr. Loomis and Lori. Michael Myers is sent to an insane asylum following the murder of his sister. 15 years later, Dr. Loomis is there to escort him to court to see if he's going to continue to be incarcerated. Michael escapes, he steals a car, and the rest of the movie is Dr. Loomis trying to hunt him down while he terrorizes a bunch of small-town teenagers, kills people, and at one point I think he eats a dog. Very general outline, but throughout this movie there are several frustrated moments where Dr. Loomis has these monologues where he's trying to communicate to people that he's been watching Michael Myers for the last 15 years, he's the epitome of pure evil, he cannot be reasoned with or rehabilitated, he must simply be stopped or else he's just going to keep hurting people. And so the reason it's right wing is just in the way that it treats Michael Myers, particularly with his relationship to Dr. Loomis, who may I remind you, is technically a mental health professional. It's like the Mystery Grove tweet, right? You know, you look at modern horror, whether it's Smile or the Babadook, and it's like, oh, wow, this is such a smart metaphor. We just all have just this generational trauma. And if we repress it and don't heal and grow and take SSRIs and we risk passing it down to others versus Dr. Loomis just like, hmm, I'm going to medically diagnose you as evil and then shoot you with a gun. Like, that's awesome. That makes sense to me. Oh, Michael Myers just needs a social worker. No, he needs to be shot. Do not read too deeply into that. But I'm just like, the point is, it doesn't matter if the evil is coming from the out group or from within. It's, it's a way of understanding evil that says, look, we have to be realistic about this person. Hold them accountable. They're not a victim. They were not victim of some circumstance. By all apparent measures, this guy grew up in a very nice home with a very, with a very nice family. He murders his sister still, and he's going to continue murdering people. Like, we have to deal with that. The liberal understanding of psychology, incarceration, it focuses on mental health being harmed by trauma and prison as a means of rehabilitation, which is ultimately saying none of this is really your fault. You just had bad luck, bad circumstance. And so we're going to try to correct this in the meantime by giving you pills, putting you in jail. But once we make society equal, none of this is really going to be necessary since nobody would ever just do something bad except white men. It's only when they're put into tough circumstances that they do bad things. Yeah, okay, well, uh, it's not how that works, but it doesn't even consider that some people might be just 
like that. Some people might just be impossible to rehabilitate. But if you want to know why our country is so mentally unwell and so incapable of actually delivering justice, it's because both of those institutions are governed by those orthodoxies, which are ultimately just ideological and delusional. And the reason I know this is true is because you look at the evolution of this story, Halloween. Look at what happens in the 2007 remake, the Rob Zombie version. It's the completely opposite depiction. It's the same story, same general happenings. But it totally cucks. It shows young Michael Myers getting bullied at school. His household is abusive. His family's poor. My nurture, my nurture, my socioeconomic factors, my generational trauma. It's like it's a way of telling the same story, but it's trying to make us sympathize with Michael Myers by beginning the story showcasing him not as a killer, but, but really as a victim of circumstance. Give me a break. And again, I'm not unsympathetic to horrible circumstances. I acknowledge fully that people can be dealt horrible hands throughout their lives, even from birth. But our society is based on acknowledging and sort of agreeing that despite that, we're still going to be civilized. That's literally what defines civilization. And that's really the critical mass, I think, for your maturation. Like, when you realize that nothing is fair about life, nothing is just, and you can either spend your entire life resenting that, or you can try to just make the best of it. Like, being a man means that nothing is your fault, but everything is your responsibility. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you don't try to seek justice and make things fair when they are so obviously not fair. But what tends to happen is people want to just use their circumstances as an excuse to treat other people unfairly and to do the wrong thing. And that's just not acceptable. And that's the problem with depictions like these is that they're clearly intended to make us sympathize with criminals. And when you have a media ecosystem that's saying, wow, you know, criminals are just like you and me, except, well, they've had a hard life. And then you've got a political ecosystem that is defining criminal justice reform as going softer on these people. What that equals is more innocent lives being taken because these insane ideological commitments are just festering throughout our institutions. And so that really does highlight the contrast between the two films being, you know, the 1978 version, the 2007 version. That's really the true dichotomy which John Carpenter seemed to be trying to articulate in terms of evil, which is whether we are made to be inclined to excuse or sympathize with evil behavior or otherwise be inclined to question our moral values. And the original doesn't do this, but the 2007 version does do this. And there was a guy I found on YouTube who was talking about this. He managed to get it exactly backwards. I, I have to play it for you because it was so wrong. It, it actually like needs to be studied. Just take a look. The way I'm going to use this idea is to look primarily at the horror villain and to try and determine whether they come from an outside force or whether they're from within a community. Let's start with Carpenter's slasher Bible, Halloween. Who is the bad guy? Does evil come from within society, or are they other? The way I see it, the opening scene answers this question pretty well. The film opens with a POV murder, a shot that says almost literally that the evil on screen is coming from within. We see the suburban setting, and that the person committing the crime is native to suburbia, so the evil comes from within that community. Michael Myers is from the neighborhood in which he kills. The suburbs of Haddonfield, even the Myers home itself, are practically indistinguishable from any other suburb in North America. It could happen anywhere. It could happen in your own community. That's why Halloween is so special. Ding, ding, Halloween 1978 is left-wing horror. Okay, so this is the same problem. It's like, yeah, I get what you're saying. I get the point you're making, but the model is just incorrect. Like maybe at the time it was subversive and left-wing to depict suburbia and human nature this way, but taken into the broader cultural context, how this film treats evil, it really, it just doesn't hold weight, especially then when you look at the 2007 version, which really makes everything fall apart. Of course, this is where his argument disintegrates. Take a look. By contrast, Rob Zombie's 2007 remake of Halloween depicts Michael Myers, his family, his home, as outsiders to the Haddonfield community. The film is a cruel, blunt instrument set out to undo anything that was frightening about the original. Rob Zombie has a way of pointing his camera at his subjects in an almost hateful way. It feels like he's pointing at someone and saying, ew, look how gross and f***ed up this person is. The Myers home in 2007's Halloween couldn't exist anywhere. It's the perfect blend of abuse, neglect, and poverty that destines Michael to be a cold-hearted killer. It couldn't be anyone. It couldn't happen anywhere. It happens because everyone around Michael is cruel to him. The Myers family does not belong in this community. They are clearly outliers. And thus, I'd argue Rob Zombie's Halloween is patently right-wing. Not to mention the weird anti-sex worker stuff in this movie. They undercut Michael's first murder with his mother pole dancing at work, as if to say, See what you did? Your kid is a murderer because you're a sex worker. If that ain't some right-wing bullshit, I don't know what is. Okay, do you see what I mean though? It's not right-wing because, oh, the Myers family is the other. Oh, they weren't accepted in their community. Yeah, like probably for a good reason. Have you seen the way these people are behaving? They're like pretty much the worst. And it's not Michael's fault, but at a, you know, it's like he's experimenting with killing animals. I'm not really concerned about whose fault that is per se. It just 
stay away from my family at that point. But that only works if you subscribe to the model being whether evil is coming from within or from the other, which I don't because it's wrong. And this is the problem with these people as a whole, like why they love things like sources and experts so much. They cannot independently think through things. And so they need some information, some framework to be their like authoritative frame of reference. And that will then guide them to conclusions, which are typically absurd, but that would never occur to them because they arrived at them from using the expert framework. But again, this guy is incapable of understanding that because he can't see the world through that lens. He has to view it through the lens of class, discrimination, people being mean. Did you just shame a sex worker, my dude? Uh, yikes. Try being a decent freaking human being. And you can tell because of the way he unnaturally tries to use the word ain't and it just sounds forced. Like they always try to mimic the behavior and language of the lower classes to create some sort of sense of solidarity. It's just very weak behavior. But the bottom line is whether we are going to make excuses for individual behavior or if we are going to hold people accountable for the choices they make regardless of circumstance, if we're gonna be confident enough in ourselves to make those moral indictments and honestly assess whether some people are simply beyond rehabilitation, that's why Halloween 1978 is implicitly right wing. Moving on, number two, Coraline. Probably have seen this one, very fascinating, great soundtrack, great animation style, it's based on a novel. And essentially the plot is that this girl moves into a new house with her parents, they don't pay enough attention to her. So she starts exploring, she discovers this new world that seems to be a mirror of her world, except everything is fun and perfect and her parents spend a lot of time with her, etc. But eventually, she learns that things actually aren't as good as they seem, and her new mom is trying to get her to give up her eyes to stay with her there forever. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Is Coraline actually an anti-trans allegory? One second, baby birds, I will feed you. You know, I actually thought about including Sleepaway Camp, because the big scary plot twist at the end of that movie is just that the girl who's killing everybody is actually a boy. And back then people saw that and were like, wow. Uh, or maybe even Silence of the Lambs, you know, Buffalo Bill, homicidal transvestite who wants to wear women's skin, which of course literally never happens because there is no overlap between serial murder and LGBT identification. You know, in general, I think it's overlooked how significantly the widespread commercialization of the true crime, serial killer genre, that whole thing has contributed to the erosion of trust levels in society, which isn't to say it's the largest factor, but it's still interesting, especially because when you examine these types of stories under microscopes with the strength to extract the details necessary to satiate the detail-hungry masses, it almost always reveals patterns of deep sexual perversions being demonstrated by the killers. Like these same guys, Dahmer, Gacy, etc., these same guys who get off to doing stuff with dead bodies, using body parts to pleasure themselves, getting off to the act of killing in general, these guys also got off to doing things that we're told now are perfectly normal and natural, and if you notice any patterns, you are ontologically evil. No, hey, I'm not, I'm not Michael Myers. I'm just a sensitive young man, okay? Excuse my behavior. I mean no harm. I'm just saying. I get to, I get to just say. I reserve that right. But you can't ignore it's all basically just a sliding scale of sexual depravity. I mean, there's a reason that all lasting societies have placed very strict standards on sexual conduct. It's a dangerous Pandora's box to open or to be open-minded about, so to speak, but... Also, Hannibal Lecter, he's got a pretty good line, too, in the novel. I don't think he says it in the movie, but basically, Clarice Starling is trying to get him to fill out this questionnaire so she can evaluate him psychologically and try to establish a profile for future use. And he says something like, oh, Clarice, do you think you can dissect me with this little tool? And she's like, um, no, but it might provide some insight into what happened to you and to what made you like this. And he's like, nothing happened to me, Clarice. I happened. You can't reduce me to a set of influences. You've given up good and evil and exchanged them for behaviorism. You've got everybody in moral dignity pants. Nothing ever anybody's fault. Look at me. Can you bring yourself to call me evil? And that's pretty based. It's kind of like in Halloween. And obviously it's not that black and white in reality, but it's a lot closer to this than what we're supposed to believe now and what we're being conditioned by virtually every institution in society to believe about good, evil, individual behavior, etc. But anyways, Coraline, this was inspired by a couple posts I put up on my Instagram story a while ago, where I posted a photograph of a teenage girl showing the results of what's referred to as top surgery, which is when girls who self-identify as transgender will have their breasts removed surgically, and it leaves a scar across their chest, uh, their nipples are gone, and you can look up what that looks like if you would like to. But I posted this photograph and I said something like, remember, these are the people who call you a radical extremist for holding beliefs that would have been completely uncontroversial 50 years ago, even just a decade ago in many cases. Uh, it's like, wow, I'm so lucky I wasn't brainwashed into becoming a Nazi after I watched a Ben Shapiro video when I was 14. But then you look at what TikTok brainwashes them into instead. And, you know, it is what it is. And then I posted this where I said, reminds me of another tale of adults grooming children. Is Coraline implicitly right wing? And so here we are. 
So if you haven't seen it, like we said, it's the archetypal fairy tale story. But really what made me start looking into it was that imagery, was the visual of the doll with the stitches and the scarring. And then it just clicked. And then I could not unsee it. First, the blue hair. It is inviting this analysis. You've got this impressionable young girl with blue hair. Her parents don't have blue hair. There's no blue hair gene. She dyed it. She's bored. She's upset. With her life, she moved away from her friends. Her parents don't pay attention to her. She's depressed. Then this creature takes advantage of that vulnerability. Hey, this is what your life is supposed to be like. Look at this caricature of your identity. Look at how everything could be better for you. You get everything that you deserve out of life. People treat you the way you deserve to be treated. The old white people, your parents, everybody will affirm your existence instead of just ignoring it. Okay, sounds great. How do we make this happen? Well. You gotta give me your eyes. I have to perform this surgery on you that's gonna leave you horribly disfigured. That's right, that's the fairy tale bargain. You give me a part of yourself, in this case her eyes, irreversibly, and you will be happy, everything will be better for you. Eyes, of course, being a representation of the ability to like align yourself with reality, to see, to perceive reality, to not be blinded, to be taken advantage of. And everybody around her is hinting to her, you probably shouldn't be getting into that world, but they just don't understand. So she does it anyways, because the other mother figure is literally grooming her. And of course, it's an overbearing mother, right? Of course, she has no children of her own, so she has to corrupt others' children. And what happens when the victims of the other mother's grooming try to speak out? They're silenced, they're censored. What about Coraline's real parents? Certainly they wouldn't want this to be happening, right? Yeah, that's why the other mother blocks them from doing anything about it. Oh, you're gonna try to stop me from grooming your child? Hmm, no actually, I think you have to go to jail like in a snow globe, but it's the overbearing mother. It's the weak father who's literally puppeteered by her even though he knows it's wrong and he tries to leave hints to help Coraline, sure, but he ultimately never stands up to the other mother himself because this literal witch, this occultic entity wants to feed off the souls of the innocent and vulnerable to validate its own existence. And so it preys upon children in distress and it tells them, I know what will make you happy. Your parents don't understand, they don't listen to you. You should listen to me, you should sell me your soul because I'm promising you happiness. Very interesting. Sounds like the moral of that story is that parents need to watch their kids, especially nowadays with social media. You think they're safe because they're under your roof, but you never know what they're getting involved with. All right, moving on. Number three, Squid Game. I already know what you're gonna say. Well, actually, a Squid Game's not a movie. Yeah, well, this isn't your list, so go cry about it. I don't know. When Squid Game was popular, I forgot to talk about it, so I have to do it now. I have to. The real horror is the idea that someone somewhere would not get to hear my opinion on literally any topic at any point. So, uh, yeah. So this is another one of those things where people think it's left wing because it's critiquing capitalism, which is largely to say it's critiquing usury and it's like, yeah, same. You know, I remember at the time people on the right were freaking out about this. They were calling it communist propaganda, anti-capitalist propaganda. We really just have to stop viewing these things through such immature lenses, these very like sophomoric dichotomies where everything is either communism or capitalism, individualism versus collectivism, et cetera. Like we wonder why we can't make culture on our sides because most of us are just illiterate. The reason this show is ultimately right wing is because what it portrays is natural and honest about human dynamics, particularly between men and women during these high stakes, life-threatening situations. Like there are no girl boss characters. No, like the only way women survive is by being deceptive and cunning, seducing men, things like that. Whereas men tend to advance through just brute strength, ability. So that's really what I'm concerned about. Like, is this piece of media lying to me about human nature? Are you trying to make normal things that are so obviously not normal? And you had everyone at the time, everyone on the right was so mad about this show. And then you had some Cato Institute types who were like, well, actually it's, it's right wing because that wasn't real capitalism. That was corporatism, blah, blah, blah. I don't care if it was about capitalism. It can be about capitalism. You can not Economic systems are not what is going to compel me in a story where the stakes are this high. That doesn't make it left wing. I don't care. I'm like Patrick Starr, you know. All the conservatives hated this show. Yes. All the liberals loved this show. Yes. So that would seem to make the show left wing. That makes sense to me. So Squid Game is left wing. No, it's right wing, you stupid idiot. Like modern society being unable to provide for the average person is not as a result of a decades long incumbent political consensus which reflects my beliefs. Capitalism forces people to risk their lives to pay off unfair debts. Okay, maybe, sure. But also, honestly, are you telling me that people wouldn't just sign up for this voluntarily? Let's say there's no debt. 
No exploitation. It's just open to the public, compete to the death for money. People would sign up for that because, yeah, people are greedy. They like money. But there is a component of vitality to it as well. They're like gladiators. It's a warrior experience. And modern society, if you want to talk about it, provides very few opportunities for men to channel that impulse anymore. Why do you think the last 20 years of media has been things like, oh, The Walking Dead, Lost, Breaking Bad, the whole post-apocalyptic genre? All of that media is about men becoming who they are. So I'm not saying it's moral to hypothetically construct this competition where people can fight to the death for money, but what I am saying is that we have to stop automatically assigning people victim status when they are perfectly happy to do something, which is different, by the way, from when something's obviously making them miserable and they just pretend otherwise, but... I see this a lot from people on the right where they're like, oh, these poor soldiers, they're victims. Wow. Stop the violence. It's all so sad. What are you talking about? Have you ever spoken to a man before? Constantly fantasizing about taking down muggers, burglars, blue helmets, whatever. After Vietnam, we found this out, that a large reason that combat veterans have trouble readjusting to society after they return isn't because they're just so traumatized. Of course, war changes you, but it's because once you experience the feeling of going to war with other men, that's tough to walk away from. That's tough to adjust from. And obviously, I don't have experience with this because our military doesn't fight wars for Americans anymore. But if we did something like, I don't know, militarize the southern border, I would sign up overnight. And you can hold me to that. My point is just that if somebody thinks they've been victimized or they give the appearance of that, that's one thing. But I see a lot of people trying to assign victim status to soldiers automatically. And it seems to be from the usual suspects who would do it just because they're afraid of male behavior and what that's capable of. But anyways, yeah, the director says, oh, it's a fable about modern capitalist society. Who cares? People degrading themselves for money? Sure. But if I made a version about how modern capitalist society forces people to degrade themselves for money by becoming sex workers, well, all of a sudden that wouldn't be so left wing now, would it? Also, it spends a not insignificant amount of time focusing on these elite sex parties and rituals. The left never really likes to talk about things like that. They like to ignore it or dismiss it. And I honestly think it's because they're like offended by the idea of sexual abuse not being democratized. Like, why do only the elites get to do this? Why only the 1%? No fair. Like, seriously, obviously, judging by their conduct, they're not offended by abuse or grooming. So clearly, they're just like resentful because they're excluded from it. Resentment, of course, being at the core of all leftism. So, all right, moving on, number four, the remake of The Last House on the left. Very importantly, the remake. This might be my favorite one on the list, so we're gonna spend a lot of time on this one because similarly to Halloween and the evolution of that story between the original and the remake, this story perverts itself and then is redeemed. Allow me to explain. So the original Last House on the left in 1972 was written and directed by the legendary Wes Craven before he did other movies like A Nightmare on Elm Street uh, and Scream. And the basic plot is a girl goes out with her friend, they get into a bad situation, they're brutally violated and killed by these people, and then these people end up going to her parents' house just by happenstance, and the parents piece everything together, and then they get their revenge on the people who killed and violated their daughter. Now, this is actually a good example of a horror film that was legitimately subversive and honestly well done because you've got themes that are right-wing, you've got the father as the head of the household, he's the patriarch, he's defending his daughter's honor and her chastity by essentially becoming a vigilante, and it has the family as the source of safety and security against the other who seek to corrupt their daughter and harm her. And in contrast to the 1972 version where it's like, okay, yeah, you violated and killed my daughter, you deserve the worst. The fact that what happens in the 2009 version to the killers is even more brutal and the daughter wasn't even killed proves that it's not just like revenge in the broadest sense of the term because something bad happened, but revenge for something terrible happening that harmed the honor of the family, that breached its security, that the father views as transgressive to his authority and insulting to him by harming his family. Now, what's interesting, and this is why ultimately the 1972 version is subversive and the 2009 version is our movie, because the stories and the way that they conclude and how they portray the characters throughout them are different. So to give you the full picture and the full context, we're going to have to wind the clocks back. But basically, what happens is that at the end of the 1972 version, the audience is made to feel that the parents were unjustified in their actions and that they're actually just as bad as the people who brutalized and killed their daughter. Whereas at the end of the 2009 version, it basically like glorifies the parents doing what they did. And so that's sort of tying back to the revision that we did earlier 
on John Carpenter's model, where we said what ultimately defines it is something to the effect of whether we are made to sympathize with the villains and or question our moral convictions. And the family is, of course, central to this story as a whole and also to the entire genre as a whole and to Wes Craven as a filmmaker. Because like we said earlier, older horror movies were more focused on a creature or like a ghost, things of that nature. But since around the 1960s, horror movies have been dominated by a handful of motifs being the monster or evil as like a psychopath or a schizophrenic, like in Psycho or slasher movies, things like that, or uh, The Revenge of Nature, things like The Birds, Day of the Animals, uh, The Happening, remember that one? Also Satanism, Demonic Possession, The Antichrist, like in Rosemary's Baby, The Exorcist, The Omen. You know, we don't really have ghost movies anymore. We have demon movies, and there is some significance to that, I think. Uh, the Child from Hell, right, which is often connected to the satanic motif, things like The Omen, again, Carrie. Uh, then you've got Cannibalism, like in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Hills Have Eyes, Night of the Living Dead, etc. And all these motifs, even though they seem somewhat separate, they can all actually be unified and drawn together by one unifying force, which is the family unit. And in the case where the connection to the family unit is the most tenuous, probably the revenge of nature, that motif as a whole, that ended up being the least successful and productive in comparison to the other motifs. And in the more successful examples of it, namely the birds and squirm, the attacks still seem to be linked to or drawn out by sexual or familial tensions. So in the other ones, the connection between the family unit uh, has been much more consistent. The psychotic, the schizophrenic, the antichrist, the child monster, you know, all these things are shown as a part of the family, whether the family family is guilty or innocent like in The Omen. So older horror films were much more focused on monsters. We had a tour of service perhaps with science fiction invaders where the heroes were always American, perhaps a metaphor for foreign or uh, communist infiltration, good thing that didn't end up happening, but since the 60s and 70s, horror movies have followed the trend of subverting the family unit, questioning its goodness, its utility, its naturality, etc. But in some cases, like the 2009 version of Last House on the Left, it ultimately is good because we see the family unify and triumph over the other. So it does depend on the movie in itself, and popular media is often a good measure for people's anxiety, so perhaps the success of the horror genre can in part be attributed to that it reflected the anxieties people felt about the collapse of the family structure during the same time period. And Wes Craven himself, like we said, has been pivotal in this because the majority of his films in some way or another focus on the collapse of the family in modern America. In The Last House on the Left, it's the generation gap, uh, the child abuse scene in the Krug family who ends up attacking and killing the main family's daughter, it's the overbearing parental figures in The Hills Have Eyes, alcoholism, murder, a negligent father in A Nightmare on Elm Street. You've got unfaithful family members in Scream, in A Stranger in Our House, incest in People Under the Stairs, et cetera, et cetera. And so the causes may be diverse, but the overall disintegration is constant. So in The Last House on the Left, we're not only questioning the family unit and the actions taken by the parents after what happened to their daughter, but it's also, of course, doing a lot to make the audience try to sympathize with the attackers in themselves and even dislike like the parents in some cases. Like when they arrive at the family's house, there are elements of class conflict. They're obviously lower class. They don't have manners, etc. But before we continue to really understand the whole story, we do have to go back to a movie from 1958 called The Virgin Spring, which Last House on the Left was written to serve as a sort of reinterpretation of by Wes Craven. So The Virgin Spring is a Swedish movie which debuted in America in 1960, ended up winning an Academy Award for Best Foreign Film. And the screenwriter for this movie took inspiration from a story from medieval Germany originating sometime around the 12th and 14th centuries called Tor's Daughter, which despite them having discovered something like two dozen variations of the story, it does follow the same general plot, which is that there are some daughters, they're on their way to church, they get brutalized by a group of men, these men end up stumbling across the father, and the father puts two and two together, and then enacts revenge against the perpetrators. Now, The Virgin Spring tells this story pretty well, and Craven's adaptation is much more modern, we'll say, because in The Virgin Spring, the girl's on her way to light candles for the Virgin Mary, and in The Last House on the Left, she's on her way to a rock concert. And so, the reason it's called The Virgin Spring is because in the aftermath, her father's devastated. I mean, he's questioning God's existence, how God could let such brutality occur in a world that he creates and that he controls. 
And he goes to build a church where his daughter was killed. And then by miracle, a spring services, this beautiful freshwater spring. And we end on this high shot showcasing the spring and the surrounding brutality and the people praying. And it answers the film's prior questioning of Christ by showing that he does ultimately watch over man, even if he doesn't always stop the evil that occurs in the world which surrounds us. Now, we contrast this with the modern ending in The Last House on the Left in 1972. And the parents are just in their living room. It's quiet. There's no moment of enlightenment or truth. They're just in shock, seemingly like horrified at their own actions. In the credits roll, we hear a song titled, The Road Leads to Nowhere. And the lyrics are exactly that. The road leads to nowhere. There's no point. It's, it's existential. It's nihilistic. The only destination is death. There's no God. Nothing follows. Only death. There's no redemption. There's no higher shot implying that God is watching because in this movie, God's dead. The parents haven't even achieved redemption because now they're even questioning their own actions. They're also going to prison forever now, by the way, because the police show up too. And if there's no God, then the daughter basically ceases to be a concept the moment she dies. She can never truly have redemption, so to speak. The redemption would be from the parents feeling as though what happened to their daughter was a transgression against them, which it was. But if now they don't even stand by their own actions or feel as though they acted justly, well, then what? Nothing. All those ideas of honor and patriarchy and redemption, chastity, it was all obviously for nothing, right? Of course. Everything's relative. There's no God. There's no morality. It's all undefined. And this perfectly reflects the growing atheist sentiments of the 1970s, with many asking, even the cover of Time magazine in 1966, is God dead? You know, we watch what happens to these women as the audience, and we're craving justice. But when supposedly it's delivered, the aftermath is quiet. It's like shameful. It's unsettling. It's not a celebration. We just like feel ashamed. You know, there's not some moment of enlightenment, nothing implying a higher order. It's just darkness, just quiet, nothingness. Everything means nothing. It's all just molecules moving around, man. Like what has even been gained? Nothing. The daughter's still dead. They don't feel any better. They feel ashamed. They're shocked at their own actions. They're still on the road to nowhere. As the soundtrack says, the castle stays the same. The house is still empty, but it's just bloodier now, right? And by showcasing that as the finale of the movie, depicting the bloodshed and retribution is just nothing more than futility. It was all for nothing. Whereas the ending of The Virgin Spring, it's uplifting. It's vindicating. We have the image of the parents in this like shocked, agonizing state. It's shoved down our throats for what feels like an hour. It's like two minutes. There's no triumphant music, no overture, which we would hear is, oh, justice. It's just the image of people in pain. And so by ending in this way, by freezing on these tortured faces, the movie's actually portraying an argument against violence and against revenge, despite what the critics at the time thought, which is that it was trying to glorify and encourage it. Whereas the movie even goes as far as to make clear that it's not so much what has happened to the daughter that has traumatized the family. Again, it's absolutely horrific what those people do to her. You can go check it out for yourself, but it's not so much that, but the realization by the family of like, wow, well, I guess I'm no better than the people who did it. And that's the contrast. The final image in this movie is not of beautiful, fresh spring water indicating God's existence, the ultimate plan, putting aside the violence that we've just witnessed and focus of that existence and of that plan. Rather, we're staying on these two broken, shattered human beings and there's no plan. Everything leads to death and death leads to nowhere. The road leads to nowhere. And again, these people also broke the heckin law and the cops are there. So they're going to prison now. There's nothing that's been achieved. There's no validation. Whereas the Virgin Spring showcases forgiveness and blessings despite horrible acts of violence for those who serve God and ask for his forgiveness. And maybe there's even something to be said about literally washing the blood off your hands after having built a church in God's name. And the reason people think that's a dangerous message is because we live in a world right now where there's all sorts of evil that might compel people to act violently in service of God, such as going after abortion clinics. And obviously we disavow that. We're not talking about breaking any laws here, but this is the eternal libtard motif, which is spread into every Every facet of our civilization, like a cancer, this idea of believing in something might cause you to defend it with violence. And so it's actually better to just believe in nothing and just be a cynic and a hedonist for your entire life. So we can see how the film from which this was inspired was actually subverted. It was revolutionized to meet modern standards. And there are a lot of other subtle film techniques in the 1972 version that present this same argument to the audience about how violence is never justified, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't want to spend too much time on this one. But it's also subversive in the sense that at the time, it was considered to be the goriest movie ever produced up until I think Texas Chainsaw a couple years later, which is another libtard movie that's trying to say, apparently, like, oh, well, you know, eating animals is actually just as bad as eating people. It's like, okay. But this movie is anti-violence. The title, too, being The Last House on the Left, implying, well, this could happen to anybody. 
anybody's capable of this. It's all about what environmental factors you're subjected to. Everything is so freaking complicated. But it also, you know, like if it celebrates it though, the violence is retribution for what they did to the daughter. Well, then it's actually like based in red pill. It's like anybody's capable of this. Become who you are, patriarch. Have justice. Um, but there are some other things going on that contribute to the context of the film's release. Like you had the increasingly popular superhero genre, the 70s crime wave, violent crime increasing like 126% between 1960 and 1970, and then another 64% between 1970 and 1980. So perhaps there's like a critique of vigilantism in this movie, which is cringe. Uh, there's probably something too about the Vietnam War with the anti-violence, moral relativism, stuff like that. And there are a lot of more subtle things too throughout this movie that are subversive. Like there are a lot of other examples of trying to directly expose or highlight the hypocrisy of characters, particularly the parents and their moral standards, their moral traditions, things like that. Oh, well, the friend who the parents said is a negative influence is actually a freaking good person who tries to save the daughter. Oh, well, the mom says that not wearing a bra is bad because it brings bad attention, but actually mom equals bad because she's wearing a bra that actually highlights her boobs. Wow, everything is so freaking complicated. There's also strong anti-cop sentiment too. The police are totally incompetent. There's anti-justice system sentiment because the killers are able to escape from prison. Uh, and which is also hilarious because it's simultaneously telling the audience Law enforcement is incompetent. The justice system is incompetent. But also, don't freaking take things into your own hands. It's like the epitome of the sort of cynicism and nihilism that was infecting the country right around the same time. There's not a single character in this movie who is not involved in some moment or subplot that is supposed to expose the hypocrisy or incompetence of institutions or moral frameworks that are important for our society to function as it should. It wants to subvert them. Whereas the 2009 version has a much more clear us versus them, bad guys are evil, good guys are good, and it becomes much more clear every year that in a corrupt and fallen world, we have to be willing to use force to defend our own, to defend our families. And so the ending of this version is triumphant. It's very cinematic, slow motion. Everybody gets on the boat. They literally ride off into the sunset together as a family, nice. And then the, the treat for the audience for sticking around is the sequence where he just kills a guy. There's no moment of reflection, no like, oh my gosh, what did we do? Just tying up loose ends, audience walks away, everyone's happy, splendid, the bad guy's lost. Even the taglines are different. The 1972 version famously said, to avoid fainting, keep repeating, it's only a movie, it's only a movie, which is like, yeah, we're gonna show you a bunch of violence and then you're gonna walk away like, oh my gosh, that was all so equal and bad. And in 2009, it's like, if bad people hurt the ones you love, how far would you be willing to go to hurt them back? So true. No further analysis needed, no nuance. Bad news, bad guys hurt one of the good guys. We got some work to do. Um, are you sure we're not taking this too far? Shut up, hippie. The root of this story, it goes all the way back, going all the way back, all the different versions. It's ultimately an attack of the daughter and her honor, her purity, the father's willingness to seek vengeance for this because he views those attacks to be by extension against him. The 2009 version acknowledges this with a line where the guy talks about how tight the daughter was when he's taunting the dad before the dad ends up taking him down and it's vulgar and it's horrible, but there's a reason he said it. And it's no surprise to me that an ideology which is skeptical of the importance of family structure, purity, honor, et cetera, views all these things as socially constructed, as archaic. It's no surprise to me that that person would conclude that violence in service of redeeming those things is ultimately bad. And at that, just as bad as the violence against those things in the first place. Also, the 1972 version is much more rebellious, rock and roll, free love than the 2009 version. The 2009 one basically just has the girls like, okay, I'll go do some gay weed. I'll go do some gay weed like a gay person. So it's not like an either version the girls are perfect angels going to light candles for the Virgin Mary, but the 2009 version is certainly a lot closer to that than the, uh, the 1972 version. And it also brings back those clear dividing lines, which the 1972 version had made such an effort to blur. In the remake, there are very clear dividing lines between good and evil, whereas Craven made a serious effort to show the humanity of the bad guys and the ease with which the good guys could slip into this violent, manic vengeance and be no better than the bad guys. And he even said as much about the movie, I think, that he wanted to just throw the whole moral compass out the window, which he does do. I mean, he deconstructs that objective morality that exists in the Virgin Spring, but then we run it back in the 2009 version, so it's all okay. Good old family values. That's what that movie is about. The 2009 version, it's about the family seeking vengeance. It's driven out of a desire to protect the family, which is the opposite of Craven's legacy, as we mentioned, which is basically subverting the family. And for what it's worth, 
This was common throughout Hollywood in general during this time period. I'm not trying to sit here and tell you that Wes Craven is responsible for the collapse of the American family, but the horror genre in particular did. Like we said, it turned the family into a source of horror and evil in many cases, whereas the 2009 Redeemed Cut does the opposite because it restores the family to being the source of safety and protection and survival and being good as an institution, like that protects against external threats. So I'm not saying the 2009 remake was better exactly than the 1972 version, just that it agrees with my worldview, which counts for something. I appreciate it. You know, I appreciate that the 2009 version upholds what we naturally want to see, returns to the tradition of the original story that the 1972 Libtard version tried to subvert. You know, it's like we said in the Beauty and the Beast video, our perspective of the characters is manipulated and informed by how much time we spend with them, what we see them doing, et cetera. And the 1972 version has a mother and father just out of breath in this bloody room and they're shocked with themselves. Their face is saying, what have I done? That's literally how it ends. A freeze frame on the dad looking horrified with himself. Plus the police show up. All these people are going to prison forever. Oh, oh my gosh, when I found out that these guys raped and murdered my daughter, I, I should have just filed a police report and trusted the judicial process like a good citizen. Now look at me. Oh man, oh man, I guess morality is so freaking complicated. I should just trust our civic institutions to deliver justice justice. Okay, cuck. Yeah, I hope you get violated. Have fun in prison. But in the 2009 version, dad just puts the guy's head in the microwave, just walks away like Billy Badass. Head explodes. Boom. Credits. No police. Just some shots of the household. The fortress. His fortress. The head of the household. The patriarch protecting his daughter. No police. No gay philosophizing. Just it's, it's a climax. That's the conclusion. That's the takeaway. Oh my gosh. I just did to them what they did to my daughter. How am I any better than them? My principles, morality, and people are so freaking complicated and nuanced, whoa, versus the Chad, hmm, you just hurt my daughter. I did not appreciate that. I think we'll see if I can use an appliance to explode your head. That's like the bottom line. That's, that's the story as a whole. It is linked to patriarchy. It is linked to absolute morality. It is linked to God. The Wes Craven version tried to subvert that. The 2009 version redeems it. It restores order. And by the way, I disavow everything I just said. I am simply a film critic, okay? But a lot of horror movies are serious enough attempts at art to be worth the time that you spend thinking about them. All that said, if you're going to watch a version of it, you should probably watch the 1972 version. It is a classic, okay? I'm pretty sure it's on YouTube for free. So on to our last one, number five, The Original Pet Cemetery from 1989. Based, of course, on the 1983 novel by Stephen King. You know, I was trying to think of movies that were classics for this list that I remember liking a lot, and I just sort of thought to myself, oh yeah, Pet Cemetery, because playing God is bad. Boom, right wing. But then I rewatched it, Keep in mind, I saw that movie one time, like a decade ago, when I went through my Stephen King phase. All I remember is the general plot, specifically the way the old guy gets killed, then the scene at the end, the guy's playing solitaire on the floor by himself in the kitchen. I was just kind of like, huh, that's interesting. Thought that was only on grandma's computer, crazy. But then I rewatched that before this video, that, I almost feel irresponsible, including on the list. That movie's messed up. I mean, compared to a lot of stuff that's put out nowadays, maybe it's not so bad. Um, it's really not that bad. Certainly not the most demented thing ever, but probably the most demented thing on this list. Basically what happens is you've got this family who moves to a new place because the dad gets a new job as a physician. There's a place behind their property where their new neighbor tells them there's an old pet cemetery where kids used to go to bury their pets when they died. Meanwhile, weird stuff starts happening to the family. A bee sting here, a skin knee there. Then this guy gets into an accident and he tells the dad to stay away from the cemetery. Then he calls him by his name, even though they'd never met before, and then he dies. Anyways, their family cat ends up dying too, and the dad doesn't want the daughter to be sad, and so the neighbor guy's like, oh, you know, go behind the pet cemetery. There's this Indian burial ground that can bring things back to life if you bury them there. And he tells them that he did that when he was a kid with his dog, but it might be a little bit different uh, when it comes back, but it'll save the daughter from the grief. And so the cat comes back to life, acts all weird and vicious towards the dad. Its eyes are glowing now, whatever. Then the little boy ends up getting hit by a truck on the same road that the cat dies on. He's killed. And the old neighbor guy's like, don't bury your son there. Dad's like, I wasn't gonna. And then the neighbor guy tells him a story when some local guy buried his son there after he died during World War II. And basically he came back as like a zombie, terrorized the whole town. Everyone got together to try to kill the guy by burning it to death. And then the dad was also burned alive in the process by accident. And he tells them that he probably awakened some malevolent force by going there to bury the cat, which is probably why the son was killed and he should just leave it alone because sometimes dead is better. The dad essentially doesn't listen, buries the son there, son comes back to life, kills the neighbor guy, kills the wife who's the son's mom, tries to kill the dad and then the dad has to kill his own son. That part's disturbing. Not because of the nature of it by itself, but the way they do it. It'd be one thing if the dad was like, 
you know, ka-chow, one and done. This is the one thing I won't spoil. You got to go see it. He basically like tricks the sun and makes him pass out. And the way the sun reacts is just very unsettling. Just go watch it. But he does that, burns the old guy's house down, which is where this all happened. And then immediately he takes his wife's body back to the forbidden sandbox. And the ghost guy from the earlier accent, he's like, no, don't do it. And he's like, trust, because I guess he thought it would work this time since less time had passed since she died. Whereas the sun, it had been a couple days or whatever. And of course it does not work. She comes back like a disgusting zombie right at midnight. And then he starts making out with the dead wife. It's one of the worst things I've ever seen. This is how some of you MFers be, though. Bro, I can save her. Bro, she's different. She's totally switching up and deserving the consequences. So, yeah, she, of course, immediately picks up a knife and kills him. And then the movie ends. Very interesting behavior. So as I'm sure you've gathered, this movie is about grief and ultimately trying to, in desperation, conquer nature and play God. Does that make us sympathetic to the poor choices of the dad? Sure, but ultimately we see that there are bad consequences for these poor choices, so I don't think it's subversive because it just affirms what we know is true and real. And it really is a theological story too. It's trying to mimic and pervert the resurrection of Christ, but because only Christ can resurrect from the dead, only he has that power, what results instead is abominable and sinister. Like you choose to utilize this occult version of that in a moment of weakness, and then you realize, after all, it's not the same thing entirely. I mean, the devil and his servants, of course, are going to promise you one thing, and then when you invite that into your life, you learn that it's just going to torment you. And that whole sequence really is a ritual. I mean, you're giving the body of the deceased to be absorbed by this Indian demon, and in return, of course, it just punishes you, obviously, which I do kind of appreciate, actually, like, participates in indigenous culture literally one time, immediately the worst thing ever happens. So true, Stephen King. This continent is so plagued, still, by the remnants of pagan ritual human sacrifice. That's why the gnomes don't reveal themselves to us, but... Some people say it's about faith versus reason because the doctor isn't religious. He's got these conversations with his daughter where he's much more reason-based, so to speak, when she's asking about the afterlife and God after her cat dies. And then it's supposed to kind of contradict this in this moment of desperation because he has faith that burying his child will bring him back. But that's not really faith. Like it brought the cat back. So he knows it's at least conceivable. But I wouldn't use that word because you're just trying to play God. So it's like you have faith, but in what exactly? Like what powers are you entrusting? And why do you think that's a good idea? You're participating in the occult and faith in God would say, definitely do not do that. But reason as a moral would say, well, if it's possible, why can't I do that? I want my child to be alive. He currently cannot consider consent to being realived, but I can reasonably infer that he would give informed consent if he could. Therefore, this procedure is ethical and good, actually. So I will proceed. Ha! Ha! Stupid idiot! You made out with a zombie and then you died. And we all saw it. It's literally like over for you. This is your average reason enjoyer, by the way. Literally, I've seen it. These are the kinds of women that the John Doyle ankle biters are interacting with, by the way. But yeah, there's a lot of dialogue in this movie questioning why God lets people die, why it's his choice and not ours, etc. And even the dad who buried his son, who then came back as a zombie, old neighbor guy says to him, God help you. And he barks something back like, God never helped me. I helped myself. It's like, okay, well, look where that got you. I mean, you helped yourself by putting your faith into demons. You can't do that. You can't play God. You can't try to transcend death. It's always going to backfire. But it does raise some interesting questions about what life really is. What really is death, you know? If you can replicate someone's consciousness, is it really them? How can you tell? What if you can't tell? Does it even matter? Who knows? These are man-made horrors beyond my comprehension. But we see a lot of this in our culture now with AI, all these medications and surgeries and transplants, makeup, editing, abortion, all this stuff to delay death, to conquer it, to conquer life, to conquer nature. And it's all just very wrong to me. I mean, these people who've had like a hundred organ transplants, just refusing to die, like, and I completely understand, by the way, that if and when this happens to me or someone I love, I will probably feel very differently, but that's always how these things go, right? Like in a clear mind, it seems bizarre and wrong, but in a moment of desperation, who knows? You know, that's why this story is a reminder that as a man, as the head of the household, you need to be a leader. You have to be strong and you have to have a strong faith in God. Because if you don't, who knows what you'll be tempted to put your faith into as an alternative. You have to focus on your family, you need to be realistic, not think impulsively, not think with emotion, not try to conquer death or life or delay the inevitable, not debase yourself, not dishonor those you love, because look what happens otherwise. This guy couldn't keep it together and it cost him his wife, cost him his friend, his own life, now his daughter's an orphan. All just very terrible. But hey, that's just... Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel. You know, yeah. Knock, knock, trick or treat. Leave the thumbs up, please. Put the thumbs up in the bowl. I, 
high trust community, okay? I'm going to trust that you're going to do this. I don't have to monitor. I don't have to sit in the sort of nook by the front door and wait individually as you all come. You have to, I'm trusting, okay? I'm trusting you to leave the thumbs up. If you don't leave the thumbs up, if you don't go to undertack.com, if you don't subscribe to the channel, we are all literally going to die. Also, leave a comment. What did you think? What other movies did I miss out on that are implicitly right-wing? What about explicitly right-wing? What about subtly right-wing? Is there even a difference between that and the former? Who knows? Let me know in the comments. Um, turn on post notifications. You probably missed my last 30 videos, which were all posted between the months of August and presently. Uh, so turn on notifications. Also, share the video with a friend. I know some of you aren't doing that. I know for a fact. I'm looking at the numbers. And I know that. Thumbs up, comment, subscribe, turn on post notifications. Subscribe, we kind of, we covered subscribe, sort of. And then share the video with a friend. Okay, happy Halloween. Um, by the way, I am not wearing a, you know, not that it matters. It's not the Great Pumpkin. It's the Great Vermont Pumpkin Festival. My attendance at which is ambiguous at best. It, okay. Okay, bye. Yep, very cool. Why did I clarify that? Oh, yeah, because I was watching the footage and I thought, what if they think I'm wearing a, a crew neck that literally says, like, the great pumpkin, like the Charlie Brown thing? And then I was like, I don't want to falsely advertise myself as, like, a big Charlie Brown guy. I mean, I'm a Charlie Brown guy as much as anybody is a Charlie Brown guy, but a little free advertising. This video was sponsored by the... Uh, great Vermont Pumpkin Festival, by the way, they fully endorse everything that I've, they wrote, they wrote this video. They wrote all the points for this video. Um, I didn't think of any of them. I've never even seen any of the movies I discussed. I don't even know what a scary movie is. I don't know what a Halloween movie is. I don't, none of these are my ideas. This is all fully sponsored and endorsed by the Great Vermont Pumpkin Festival, where I will be performing an iteration of the arguments in this video later tonight. So go check it out. Okay, bye. Uh, Thank you so much for watching. May God bless America. Boom.